Um, just, just, to, just to give you a reference, I, I gave a lecture once. It's called the um, DJ Duplessis Memorial Lecture. The late DJ Duplessis was the former head of surgery at WITS and then eventually became the vice chancellor of WITS. And then, ever since then, the South African Surgical Research Society has a lecture in his honor. And I was called upon to give it once, and my title was Mucus, Slippery, Sticky, but Sweet and Satisfying. <laughs> and it was the 29th DJ Duplessis Lecture, and it was published in the South African Journal of Surgery, um, and, 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 and uh, the reference is there. As after these talks, I think you're going to have access to my slides or, or podcast, so you can pick up these references. In that article, I give a background uh, to mucus and uh, mucus research in Cape Town. But over the years, I've been attending the 10th European Symposia, uh, the European Symposia on Saliva, and the last one was held in 2014, organized by this very nice man, Dr. Tuan Lechtenberg, who always laughed very, who always laughs very much when he, when I try and speak to him in Afrikaans. I don't have any Afrikaans, I'm from the tail, so I know, know a few words. And, and then mix up with slang, I try and communicate with Tuan and his colleagues and they find it hilarious. So, at these meetings, <clears throat> we get the latest in saliva research. And, 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 and it's a brave new world of salivary diagnostics, which I want to talk to you about tonight. Because this statement here, new horizons in disease detection, is true, and medicine is probably going in this direction. And the man, one of the big men to watch there, is David Wong. David Wong is a dentist and cancer researcher at the University of California, Los Angeles School of Dentistry. And Wong comes regularly to these meetings, and he's given a big space there. He, he, he gives one of the uh, big uh, plenary sessions. And he says that saliva is a window to the body like the eyes are the window of, to the soul. So he, he's, he's, he's immersed in spit. I mean, this man loves, <laughs> he loves saliva. And he says the future of medical diagnosis lies in investigating the content of saliva. Anything present in blood is in spit. So saliva is merely a filtrate of blood. So why bleed people when you can ask them to spit? And I'll tell you about my students in my lab who walk around with a bucket and say, please, can I have some of your spit? It gets pretty embarrassing sometimes. Easier, saliva, saliva is easier to take, it's easier to take any number of samples of saliva on a daily basis than taking blood, which is more invasive. But the other advantage of using saliva for diagnostic purposes is that our body fluids have variations on a daily basis. People talk about diurnal variations. The spit content in the morning could be different from the spit content in the evening. The spit content before a meal could be different to that after a meal. So it would be easier to ask for saliva any number of times in a day than to take blood. And nowadays, the ethics committees are actually quite strict about bloodletting. They would prefer us not to actually take blood from people unless you have a very, very good reason for it. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can form different groups and study them. You can study saliva from so-called normal people who don't have symptoms of a particular disease and then compare saliva that you've collected from a whole group of people with a particular disease. So you're comparing the proteome. That means all the proteins that are present in the saliva at that particular time. And then you can develop saliva disease profiles for breast and oral cancer, diabetes, Jogren syndrome, and ovarian cancer. Now, this, this was an interview David Wong gave in the New York Times in 2005. 
But now, he is, runs a, a, a website called Salivary Diagnostics, in which he regularly reports his latest results. And there's a video attached to that which you can actually see. And he calls it a bloodless revolution. Spit will tell you what ails you. And it's bloodless because they're not using blood anymore, they're just asking for spit. So unlike the rest of us, David Wom enjoys talking about spit. Whenever I've met him, he's a very quiet, shy, retiring man. But get him talking about spit, and he, is pers he has a personality <coughs> change. He likes to speak of its texture, its color, its scent, and sociology. Spend a few hours with him, and one learns that saliva is a lubricant that makes food and language possible. And at that certain Greek weddings, Celebrants spit on the bride and groom for good luck. If someone spits at you, it's not a good thing. But people share saliva when they are intimate. And of course, Simon Carding, who has resolved the world's problems, kiss deeply, he says. French kisses can exchange 80 million healthy bacteria. And you know from yesterday's talk how important it is to have a good bacterial profile. Here's the answer. Now. So this is a very complicated picture of the anatomy of the mouth. But it does show, oh golly, it's, uh, it does show the glands. Well, I can point out the submandibular and I think the sublingual, subling, sublingual glands and the parotid glands. These two, the sublingual and the submandibular, secrete different, different proteins to the parotid gland. The parotid gland doesn't secrete any mucus. These two do. But I, I've, I've found some s uh, simpler pictures. So salivary glands are both intrinsic and extrinsic. The intrinsic glands are scattered throughout the buccal cavity, mucosa. This is the buccal cavity. And the extrinsic glands supply most of the saliva outside the buccal cavity and supply secretions via ducts. So you've got the parotid, the submandibular, and the sublingual. One of the, one of the problems that are quite um, common are cancers of these glands. Now, so the mouth is for digestive action. The food is mechanically broken down by chewing. And the saliva, no, normally about 25 mils an hour, is secreted and increases up to 300 mils per hour with eating. And saliva has an enzyme called salivary amylase, which degrades, which degrades starch. And if you swallow your salivary amylase that you've produced, it becomes deactivated by gastric acid. So it doesn't like an acidic environment. Okay. But Enders, in her book, of course, puts it in a better way. Parotid glands in the cheeks are the two tiny bumps in the inner cheeks that secrete saliva when needed. The submaxillary and the sublingual glands are under the tongue, and they secrete saliva continuously, about 700 mils per day. Now, she says saliva contains op opiorphan. It's the first time I heard about this. It does, doesn't say so in the textbooks. It contains opiorphan, which is a painkiller, stronger than morphine, and it has antidepressant properties. <coughs> So, is our spit partly responsible for the reassuring effects of comfort eating? That's a question she asks in her book. And the mouth is extremely sensitive. There are more nerve endings than anywhere else. A tiny seed or a little saw can drive one crazy if it's in the mouth. And, and I think we've all had that experience. How, how many of you get these aptus ulcers? You know, I have been getting them most of my life. And I have been under treatment after treatment for aptus ulcers. If I knocked my gum with a toothbrush, I would actually, in, in two days later or a day later, I would have these ulcers. And once I have one, I have a whole lot of them. And once they subside, after a week or 10 days, a few days later, I, get them, I used to get them again. And I actually, after having seen so many medical people and dentists, oral specialists, 
maxillofacial surgeons, because I work in the hospital, discussing it with them. I remember one orthopedic surgeon once said, just put some copper sulfate on it. And you know how that burns. So it makes eating difficult, it makes speaking difficult, depending on where it is. If it's at the tip of the tongue, it makes things very difficult. And it's so tiny, and yet it causes so much pain. But I want to tell you something very interesting. I found my own cure for it. Have you, this, and, and I put this slide in, it's got nothing to do with saliva, but, but we, we can use it. In a laboratory, if you gave me a sample of any mixture of protein, any fluid, and you said to me, can you first characterize the proteins in this unknown sample? The first thing I'd want to do is put them onto sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. <laughs> SDS page, right? Now, now, now it, 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 it's a mouthful, but it's very simple. It's a gel. You make a gel out of this substance called acrylamide. And because it's a network of many acrylamides, you call it polyacrylamide. And gel electrophoresis means that once you've made this gel, you put your sample on it and send an electrical current through it. That's all it is. The larger proteins would come out on the top, and the smaller the proteins would come out at the bottom. Now, I might mention a gel like this tomorrow, because this is kind of glycoprotein that I found in the mucus of patients with cancer of the stomach. All right? But I'm not going to talk about that now. I want to talk about these gels. Now, you notice here that that is the gel made of polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And that is SDS, which is called sodium dodecyl sulfate. Now, that material, or that substance, has a particular function. Now, because these gels actually give you the relative sizes of the proteins in your sample. And I told you the larger samples are retarded and don't move through the gel when you pass an electrical current through it. And the smaller ones appear lower down. Is that principle all right? So you know, oh, it's got a range of proteins from 250,000 right down to 14,000 or whatever. This gel doesn't have many proteins, so it's not giving you the full picture. Anyway, but what you have to do to your protein mixture is to denature all your protein. Now, that is a fascinating idea. Now, when your cell, each one of your cells makes a protein, all it does is it takes the building blocks of the protein, called amino acids. Amino acids are building blocks to a protein like bricks are to a building, right? And those amino acids are all joined up in a straight line, probably. That protein, no matter what kind of protein it is, an enzyme, an antibody, or it's hemoglobin, which is a transport protein, any kind of protein, and they all have different functions, will not be functional unless it folds into a three-dimensional conformation. Many people think that's the answer to life, that what's one of the most fascinating things is that this simple protein, this simple structure made up of a string of amino acids, then folds into a particular conformation, held together by the forces of nature. Covalent and non-covalent bonds, for those of you who did chemistry. And it's absolutely remarkable. The structure is so, so intricate and so complex. And that's when that protein is functional. That's when that protein, if it's an enzyme, can go and catalyze a reaction. If that protein is hemoglobin, it's made of, of four of those peptide chains, you call them peptides, that join together and it can bind oxygen and pick it up in your lungs and take it to every cell in your body. It's absolutely remarkable. You know, I must just tell you the story. Uh, I don't know if you people like Richard Dawkins or not, but I love Richard Dawkins. <laughs> He's a very rude man, but I like him very much. Because he has actually changed the face of biology. 
And he said that he was in San Francisco in the 60s, during the hippie era. And he could understand why everybody was smoking grass and getting all lyrical and poetic. He said he just has to think about something in nature, and it made him quite, uh, it gave him a high. And so he, could, he, he wasn't bothered with smoking any substances. And I can understand that. Jacques Monod, uh, um, is it right? Jacques Monod? Jacques Monod? I have to uh, uh, consult my French teacher here. Jacques Monod wrote a, a book um, about this protein folding. He thought that if you understand protein folding, you've got the answer to life. And many people come with answers. But anyway, now, what we have to do with that mixture of proteins is we have to treat it with SDS to break its tertiary structures. So they all now are, all their charges are lost. And all the proteins are going to be compared by one criterion, and that's their size. So then you put them on the gel, and so the big ones stay on top, and the small ones stay, go down, penetrate the gel and go down. Now, the issue here is all this gel can tell us is that in that sample of saliva or any kind of fluid, this patient had a protein range from 14,000 kilodaltons to 250,000 kilodaltons. And then some of the proteins have such exact sizes, you recognize them in the gel. OK. Now, so this sodium dodecyl sulfate is a denatur denaturing agent. That means it takes the natural form of the protein and unravels it into a denatured form. And there's only one or two proteins, if you remo remove the SDS, can reform its intricate three-dimensional structure. So if it's a denaturant, denaturants can be harmful. We're not allowed, when we use sodium dodecyl sulfate, I always tell my students, put on masks. Don't breathe the stuff in, because it's a denaturant. Can you imagine if it gets into your system? It'll denature your protein. You could die. But it struck me that perhaps, perhaps, toothpaste, all I knew for some reason, that toothpaste has SDS in it. <coughs> because toothpaste would like to denature bacterial proteins in your mouth. That's the principle. You using toothpaste, you brush your teeth to clean your mouth. And I, and probably many people like me, were sensitive to the substance. And you go to a toothpaste box, and you see there, in its contents, sodium lauryl sulfate. That is STS. It's another name for STS. So I phoned the dean of the faculty of dentistry. And I said, find me a toothpaste that doesn't contain sodium lauryl sulfate. He said to me, I'll investigate this and come back to you. And after weeks and weeks and weeks, I heard nothing. I went to pick and pay. And I picked up a box of Sensodyne, gentle whitening toothpaste. It doesn't have SDS. <laughs> and if I get an aptus ulcer now, once in six months, it's too much. It's fascinating. It's amazing. So just an A-side. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a storyteller, and I can get carried away. Anyway, let's go back. So the parotid glands, you'll feel, you'll feel two little bumps in your inner cheek. And then the submaxillary and sublingual glands are there. In the, behind the tongue. Now, one thing about salivary secretion is that it's the only, one of the only secretions in the body that is under the control of the nervous system. So if you have food in your mouth and you press on your pressure receptors, that message goes to the salivary center in the medulla. And then an instruction comes from the cerebral cortex to say, to tell the glands, secrete saliva. So it's under, it's under control from the brain. Okay. Now, this is one of the articles I used to prepare this talk. It's a review, Saliva, a Dynamic Proteum. And it's written by Eva Helmerhorst of Boston. And I know Eva. I've met her at the meetings in uh, Holland. She's, she, she's a very renowned saliva scientist. And she wrote this article. And I just want to tell you that when we, go, when we consider the content of saliva, we are going to consider 
largely its protein content. And you know proteins are made in cells. And you do know that genes code for proteins. So your genes, your DNA, codes for RNA, which codes for proteins. So a gene, a DNA, can make another copy of DNA, and you call that replication. When a DNA makes an RNA, you call it transcription. And when an RNA codes for a protein, you call it translation. Okay. So saliva is a dynamic proteome. And the word proteome, as I told you, talks about all the proteins in one sample of saliva or in a sample of blood or wherever you're getting your fluid from. And compare that to genome. Genome is all the genes in your cells in your body. Proteome would be all the proteins in that specific sample. And yesterday you came across this new term, microbiome. Now, the proteome of saliva, in contrast to that of serum, is subjected to a variety of physiological and biochemical processes. So when a cell in your gland makes the particular protein that it makes, that's not the end of the story. The protein is then secreted into the glandular duct, and it comes out into your mouth, and it becomes a part of saliva, and it has a specific function. Now, salivary proteins are synthesized in the salivary glands, and then they reach the oral environment of the mouth cavity via the glandular ducts, as I just told you. So the synthesized protein now goes, uh, goes through post-translational modifications like glycosylation and phosphorylation. Now, don't get, don't get overwhelmed by this terminology because I'm going to explain this to you. Now, so protein synthesis, that is your cell. That is the DNA in the cell. And when the DNA makes another DNA, as I said, you call it replication. And when it makes RNA, you call it transcription. That RNA is actually carrying information of that DNA and goes out into the cell to a structure called the endoplasmic reticulum. I'm sure you heard this in school. This is basic biology, right? Now, that is a plasmic reticulum forms a scaffold, and this RNA sits there. And amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, are added to that RNA. And then amino acids join up and form a long string of a protein, which now has the responsibility to fold into a three-dimensional structure so that it can perform its function. OK? So easy. Now, so this is an, another picture of the human cell, because I want to explain something else to you. So there's your nucleus, right? There's your endoplasmic reticulum. So you've made your protein. But once you've made that protein, that protein has to fold. And before it folds, it might have some requirements, OK? Sometimes it needs some sugar added to it. You call that glycosylation. If it needs a phosphate atom to be added to it, you call it phosphorylation. So that's what you call post-translational modification. So that protein then goes through the Golgi apparatus, which adds on the sugars that it usually has. OK? That's post-translational modification. So if you took a bite of the person sitting next to you, a nice big chunk. <laughs> what will you be consuming? You'll be consuming, you'll be consuming a lot of water. You'll be consuming protein. You'll be consuming lipids, some polysaccharides that are big carbohydrate chains, nucleic acids, because that person is made of cells, so you're going to bite right into the nucleus. Lots of ions like sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, vitamins, and bacterial products if your person's carrying a lot of bacteria or whatever. And then there's this post translational modified stuff that you will be eating. So the phases of salivary secretion, it's a truly dynamic proteome. Those proteins now which are in your saliva are all modified folded, ready to act.
So phase one is the biosynthesis, as I explained to you, when DNA codes for the protein. Actually, this, this statement, biosynthesis according to genetic blueprint in cells of the gland, is erroneous. The genes or your DNA are not a blueprint. They're more like a recipe. Dawkins makes this point over and over again. Then there's the intracellular post-translational modification. And then there's the secretion into the oral cavity or the mouth. And in the mouth, the protein could go undergo further changes. There might be bacteria there that's, that secrete enzymes which start nipping these proteins. So there is a further processing in the mouth by the host bacterial enzymes. So it's a dynamic proteome. Saliva varies according to the time of day, the food you've eaten, your health status, your age. All these factors determine your saliva. And, of course, once it does its job of helping you chew the food, you swallow it. Great. And it's a continual secretion that takes place throughout the day, but not at the same rate. When you sleep, it slows down. That's why you get up with a dry, smelly mouth in the morning. OK, and this was by Eva Helmerhorst. So the composition, it's mainly water. Everything is mainly water, even blood. We're 80% water. Our Earth is, is full of water. OK, then it's those electrolytes, which have to be at a particular, it has to be at a particular pH, because we function in a very narrow range of acidity or alkalinity. Remember that. And then it contains enzymes like amylase with digest starch in your food. And then it has proteins like lysozyme, antibodies like IgA, <coughs> and mucins. Now, mucins are my speciality. Mucins are mucus glycoproteins that give mucus its viscous and sticky characteristics. Okay? So, there's protection from microbes by saliva. So if you get an infection of the mouth, your antibody is there. Your immunoglobulins are there. Your lysozyme, which is a protein, is also bacteriostatic. It inhibits bacterial growth. You've got a bit of cyanide in your mouth. Be careful. You're a living time bomb. <laughs> then these proteins called defensins, the local antibiotic activity, and when activated, promote chemotaxis by white blood cells. Chemotaxis, white blood cells, you know, are part of your immune system. And they want to attract. So they secrete chemicals that attract things that shouldn't be in your mouth. That's what you call chemotaxis. And then the normal flora that converts salivary components to nitrates, then to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is toxic and bactericidal. It kills bacteria. But nitric oxide has many functions. I think that many years ago, I remember, nitric oxide was given molecule of the year by Time magazine. Usually they have man of the year or woman of the year. But in that year, nitric oxide won. OK, so let's look at some specific functions of some salivary proteins. My god, half an hour is gone. Salivary amylase breaks down starch, as I told you. So salivary amylase is a protein. Then there's a proline-rich glycoprotein. Proline-rich meaning it's got more proline amino acids as its building blocks than the other amino acids. We have 20 different kinds of amino acids. Proline is one of them. So the proline-rich glycoprotein binds bacteria in the mouth, especially streptococci. Then there's GP340, or salivary agglutinin, which binds your streptococcus and your helicobacter pylori, HIV-1, and influenza virus. Now, there, there is a man by the name of Daniel Malamud in New York, who for years and years worked on mucus, and then switched and started to work on GP340, which is also called salivary agglutinin, because he felt that mucus was too sticky for him to work with. And it caused a lot of problems in his laboratory, blocked all his equipment, and he said he just had to give it up. But now, as a, as a young student, and believe me, I was young once, I used a lot of Daniel Malamut's papers to familiarize myself with the topic of mucus. That is when he was still in mucus research. 
And I landed up one day having to give a talk. And I think it was in Holland. And I was placed to speak after Daniel Malamud and I was terrified because I knew of him. I knew of him and I said, my God, if I say something stupid, I'm going to be really attacked and humiliated here. And then Malamud got up to give his talk. He was given this very grand introduction. And then he said, I'm so happy that some, the, the speaker after me is going to talk about mucus because I'd really like to know what's new in the field. I've given it up a long time ago. And that was such a relief for me that he wasn't going to be confrontational. It was going to be conciliatory. OK, so you got antibodies which attack bacteria and other and H. pylori. And then you have a whole lot of statherin and his statins and uh, lactoferrin. And all these have antibacterial compounds. And then you have this Mg1 and Mg2 that form the bulk of saliva for lubrication. So it lubricates your food, lubricates your mouth. Mg1 is a mucin, a mucus glycoprotein, and so is Mg2. The other name for Mg1 is MUC5B. Very appropriately, mucus is called MUC. So the genetic name for all the mucins start with MUC. So MUC5B and MUC7 form the bulk of saliva for lubrication. They are heavily glycosylated. That is why they are not merely proteins. They are glycoproteins. And they bind and clear gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria to prevent dental caries. And the biggest news for me, the most exciting, is that my lab found, my students found, that mucus in your mouth binds HIV-1. I think that's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for the standing ovation. Now, <laughs> that's what George Burns said once when he came onto the stage and everybody gave him. He said, thank you for the standing ovation. OK, so uh, we, I'm coming to it. OK, now, I'm glad you're interested. Oral bacteria. Preventative bacteria in the mouth are important for defense against invading microorganisms. So you get good bacteria and bad, bad bacteria like you heard yesterday. So you've got antibacterial proteins, and I've named them lysozyme, lactoperoxidase, IgA, and mucin. And mucus covers the food in the mouth and follows it right through to the, to the colon. Right? Now, at this meeting, lovely meeting, most of the people who come are international experts on saliva. Right? It's organized by two in Lichtenberg in a lovely setting. It's called Eggman Anzia. I don't know, my Afrikaans pronunciation is not too good. But it's a little fishing village like Simonstown on the west coast of Holland. Lovely place. And very quiet, small like Simonstown. Reminds me a lot of Simonstown. And one of the invited, regularly invited speakers, besides David Wong, is this man here, Colin Dawes. Colin Dawes was the originator of salivary research many, many years ago. And he said he predicted that one day saliva is going to be really big in medicine. Very nice man, and he always gives the first talk, the opening talk. He's retired, he's a lot of stature, and um, you know, <laughs> we, we, we bumped into him in a part of Amsterdam you wouldn't have, think, wouldn't have thought he'd visit. So, <laughs> So, 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 you know, he's human just like us. So he gives a historical overview. And he said the last time that there is a currently a great interest in the possibility that there may be useful biomarkers of disease in saliva, not only proteins and peptides, but various omics, such as transcriptome, RNA, metabolome, or microbiome. So he says there's a lot of protective agents. We haven't even begun to define saliva's contents. Okay? And of course, David Wong was there. And he's coined this new phrase now, saliva omics. And he says, and I'm only, I'm, please bear with me, I'm just giving you the latest in scientific research in saliva. And I'm just going to talk about the highlighted parts. And it says there that saliva omics 
tools are in place to validate salivary biomarkers for Sjogren's syndrome detection and for the early detection of oral cancer and gastric cancer. I think this is fascinating, that there is coming, we're coming to a time where a little bit of your spit will tell you exactly what disease you have. It's absolutely fascinating. Okay, now, this Jorgen's syndrome is a, seems to be a huge problem. I mean, I hear so much about it at this meeting. It's an autoimmune condition that occurs in any age and is most common in older women. Many patients develop it as a complication of another autoimmune disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Most of the treatment for the syndrome is aimed at relieving symptoms of dry eyes and mouth. And most patients with it remain healthy, but some rare complications have been described, including an increased risk for cancer of the lymph glands, lymphoma. Thus, regular medical care and follow-up is important for all patients. Right? And it's very sad, because it's a systemic chronic inflammatory disorder characterized by lymphocytic infiltrates into your exocrine organs. Most people who present with it have dry eyes, which is xerophthalmia, xerostomia, which is dry mouth, a terrible condition. Usually people who are on antidepressants have that. And parotid gland enlargement, as you can see. So it's not a, not a pretty sight. Okay? So dry mouth was a big topic at this meeting, xerostomia. But what was very interesting for me is that there are so many labs in the world trying to make artificial saliva. And the problem is, so far, nobody has succeeded. Now, they say, we've made this fluid. It's got all the contents of saliva that we know of, and yet it doesn't work. It does not help patients with dry mouth. And when I'm talking about patients with, with dry mouth, with xerostomia, I'm talking about a permanent condition. I mean, we have dry mouth on the different conditions, but then we start secreting saliva again. This is a permanent condition. It affects your speech, it affects everything, your taste, the works. So now, what does that tell you? That tells you that we haven't as yet cracked the secrets of saliva. It reminds me of that biologist from New York, Lewis Thomas, the late Lewis Thomas, who wrote lovely little books called Late Night, like Late Night Thoughts, and the Medusa and the snail. And in one of his books, he said, nature is not going to yield its secrets easily to us. We scientists should not be arrogant. Okay? But here's the man again, David Wong. He is interested in using saliva and salivary markers as a diagnosis for cancer. And he publishes, he publishes in the world's leading journals. So he's very well recognized. One of the markers he thinks he has found can actually, can actually diagnose or detect early pancreatic cancer. Now that has enormous implications. If you have a clinical marker for a particular cancer and you can catch that cancer in its early stage, you can actually, you, it's also, you can effect a cure. And I think that's very important. There is something about pancreatic cancer. It's beginning to be more prevalent for some reason. And there's different types. There's the adenocarcinoma. If it's early enough, it's treatable. But then there are those horrible, what you call cystic neoplasms. They're non-mucus secreting, and they're terrible. And and, and patients have very bad prognosis. Okay, but Wong started his career using saliva for drug testing, because that's a big thing. So he worked very closely uh, with, 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 uh, with, uh, with the police. And he says, the emergence of new psychoactive substances makes the analysis of the drug market quite complicated. Some new drugs are produced in Europe other chemicals are imported from suppliers in China or India. The internet is an important marketplace for new psychoactive substances. And then they say, for decades, urine and blood have been the matrices of choice for drugs of abuse testing. Oral fluid as a sample matrix offers significant advantages. 
collection can be performed in almost any location. It's non-invasive and the sample can be taken under direct observation, thus reducing the risk of adulteration and substitution. So that's the advantage of using saliva as a diagnostic tool. Okay, so here's another paper. Human saliva, a window to dete detect uh, systemic diseases. And these people say we are developing diagnostic tools to detect heart failure and head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Right? So this, the different labs are working on different proteins from your saliva, trying to figure out whether they can be detectors of early disease. Now, wound healing properties of saliva, this kind of paper is presented at every one of these meetings. And I mean, I think you know, even, even it's, it's an old folks tale that saliva, sometimes people say, oh, you've got, you got to cut there, just spit on it and you'll be fine. So, wound healing properties of saliva. It contains a variety of proteins which play active roles in various stages of wound healing. Saliva is a rich source of tissue factor which activates blood coagulation. In humans, the salivary histatin family enhance cell spreading and cell migration, suggesting a role in wound healing. Saliva in exercise science is becoming big. Exercise physiologists have now found this, this non-invasive method for testing exactly what you're secreting when you exercise or when you're at rest. And then, of course, there's an interaction between this protein, which I told you about, which Daniel Malamud is very interested in, salivary agglutinin, or GP340, which binds candida, candida albicans in your mouth. So this is the one my daughter's most worried about. She likes green tea and salivary mucus. Green tea apparently changes the consistency of salivary mucus and makes mucus less protective. And so when I came back from Holland and I told her about it, she was very worried. Okay, but I want to talk about saliva in Cape Town. It's not, not any different. Sorry, I have a dry mouth. <laughs> okay, now, this young man, I have to say something about him. He was one of my most brilliant PhD students. He was from Eritrea and he came to my lab he was poor, he had no money, he was hungry, and he said, Prof, I want to do a PhD with you. I've got a master's degree, and I want to stay in South Africa. I don't want to go back to Eritrea. So he stayed, and we had a question. It was a question that I had been thinking about for a long time, and which I had discussed with Simon Gordon of the University of Oxford. And after the discussion, Simon Gordon invited me to work in Oxford for a while. And I worked in Oxford in the cystic fibrosis lab. Now, cystic fibrosis, as you know, is a dreadful genetic disorder which blocks up all your passages. And sort of people die from it at a very early stage. And usually the blockage factor is your mucus, right? But it's not a mucus-related disease. It's a disease of something completely different but mucus in that process becomes very thick and viscous. Now, at this meeting, I presented this paper, Salivary and Gel-Forming Mucins and the Inhibition of HIV-1. And this student was the first one who took this question, why do we not transmit HIV through the exchange of oral fluids? Now, I had this nagging belief for years, but in science, beliefs are no good. You have to have evidence. I had this nagging belief that we, it's safe to kiss and it's safe to exchange saliva because the mucus in your mouth prevents transmission of HIV-1. Okay. Now, he's sitting happily in America now. Unfortunately, he had to leave. He got his PhD. He did absolutely well. The work won several awards. But he had to leave us. And it's the way he left us that was very sad for me. I had to send him to a conference in America, and he never came back. Because if he came back, South Africa was going to deport him back to Eritrea, and he was going to be imprisoned. So we lost him. Absolutely brilliant. His work was taken up then by Julia Peacock. 
I didn't want to steal Julia's thunder and be in the photograph, but I couldn't find another one of her. So after Hapton's PhD, Julia Peacock carried on working on saliva and HIV-1 and got a distinction for her masters and won an award at an international meeting for best paper presented. That was Julia, who then registered for a PhD with me and fell in love, unfortunately, and left and got married. And I always tell her, love can never replace mucus. <laughs> okay. currently, currently, I have two other brilliant students in my, in my lab continuing this work, Sam Pillay, who's looking at the role of horse and pig saliva mucins and pig gastric mucus in the inhibition of HIV-1. Somebody asked me a question. I said, yes, sir. Somebody asked me, which animal do you think is closest to you anatomically? And I answered just now, without hesitation, the pig. Right? And if I have a chance tomorrow, I'll tell you about it. We had here in Cape Town a pig model for ulceration. And people don't know about it. People think of Cape Town, they think of Chris Barnard and the heart transplant. But I tell you, we had so many visitors from every big center in the world who had come to view this model, where we could create reproducibly. I'm sorry for those uh, people here who, who, who believe that animal research is cruel. And I agree with you, because I've stopped it a long time ago. But when I first came here, I, w I, I used the pig model that was established here. In, 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 in the Department of Surgery, in my department, in the laboratory called the J.S. Murray Laboratory, right? And this model, you could reproducibly produce an ulcer in a pig, and it had all the characteristics of a human ulcer. So you could use it to treat it or to study its characteristics. Of course, I was looking at the role of mucus in that in the ulceration. OK? So when Sam Pele started this project, it struck me that, my god, the first mucus papers that ever came out were pig salivary mucus papers from Chapel Hill in North Carolina. And they claimed then, I had already written a paper talking about the similarities of the pig stomach to the human stomach. They claimed then that pig saliva was identical to human saliva. So I knew by now that in my lab it was shown that MUC5B in your mouth is the one that binds the HIV-1 most potently and prevents transmission of the virus. I said to Sam Pillay, get some pig saliva. Get some pig saliva and test it against your virus to see if it inhibits HIV-1. Remarkable. Sam went one step further. He took some of the gastric mucus we had from pig stomach and also tested that against the virus. Now, what is interesting here is that Sam found that the MUC5B in the pig saliva was just as potent against HIV-1 as human saliva. And it was easier to work with pig saliva because you keep asking people to spit, and it just becomes rude at some point. <laughs> so we decided, why don't we go to a pig farm, give the pig a whole lot of apples or whatever to chew, and while they're chewing, just keep scooping, <laughs> scooping the saliva. But now, you might think that's easier. Do you know the ethics committee took six months to decide whether we could do that or not? Because they said you'd be disturbing the pig's meal. <laughs> and we promised them. We promised them that we wouldn't. We'd stand apart until they've just drooled enough for us to scoop it. So Sam Pillay is working on pig saliva uh, and, 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 and also horse saliva, which apparently is very potent. But the horse saliva that we got wasn't, it was terribly turbid. And so we're waiting for, to get some clearer samples. But we have found that pig saliva is just as effective as human saliva. And Gastric mucus, which I'll talk about tomorrow, is also effective against the HIV-1. So mucus now has a new role, OK? That is that it protects against HIV-1. But, but you know, science, answers come slowly. And just when you found an answer, there's 10, 10 to 20 other questions. That's what Einstein said. The minute you've solved one mystery, 
There's 20 other mysteries behind that. Then we have Isla McQuaid. Now, remember I told you that there's another factor in the mouth which inhibits HIV-1, and that's salivary agglutinin, or GP340. Isla is comparing those, that protein with mucus to see which is more effective in its potency against HIV-1. We have an international mucus, mucus club, <laughs> right? And I'm a member. It's been, we just had our 25th anniversary in Cambridge last year. We've been meeting in Cambridge, at Cambridge University, for the last 25 years. We started as a small group of about 10 or 15 people because mucus research was so new. And now, if you go to one of those meetings, it's huge. Students come, but people come from all over the world. I'm the only African, because I'm the only one who's working on mucus in South Africa, in, in, on this continent. But there's people from all over the world. And, 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 and that core group, we've become friends. And unfortunately, we've reached an age, uh, every time we say goodbye, we wonder who's going to be bumped off before the next meeting. <laughs> and it's happened. It's very sad. Okay, and of course mucus, I mean, it's famous. I mean, this, this is a flyer that was given to me at the N0 traffic light. And it says, detox your intestines of years of toxic mucus buildup, worms, parasites, and heavy metals. And this man claims to be a professor, and he had his room somewhere in Mowbray near the station. So I didn't go to him, but I, if I did meet him, I will tell him, you're right. Too much mucus, bad for you. And too little is also bad for you. Okay? And then in the literature, it's not, not that bad. In fact, it's great. <laughs> James Joyce, in his Ulysses, spoke about the snot green sea. I would rather choose snot than stay in this house. That is Paul Throw in my other life. Then there was the literary deconstruction, the significance of snot and other effluvia in the plays of William Shakespeare. So you see, you can laugh all you like. People call me Dr. Spit or Dr. Snot. It doesn't bother me in the least. Nasal discharge as metaphor in the fiction of Jane Austen. Okay, so it's an excellent, mucus is an excellent lubricant. It has adherent qualities that bind it tightly to food particles, prevents contact between food and the stomach wall, and the adherence to fecal pellets. Now there's two types of mucin. There is the secreted type, which is gel forming. So if I opened one of your stomachs, and took a glass slide and scraped it, right? You'll only see that the surface of the stomach is glistening. I'll take a glass slide and I'll gently scrape the surface of your stomach and pick the slide up and there will be a trail of mucus right to the floor because it's viscous. And its viscosity is due to that mucus glycoprotein or mucin or muck. Okay? Now, there is another type which sits on the surface of the cell, on the apical surface of the cell, facing the lumen of the ducts in which it is formed. It's like a TV aerial. It receives messages. It also forms a protective layer against microbes and things like that. And those are called transmembrane mucins, right? Now, there's a whole lot of them that are being discovered. It's very interesting. If I took one of those, which is called MAC1, sitting on the surface here, in breast cancer, it's been found that when a normal cell with its apical surface MAC1s transforms into a cancer cell, MAC1 production in that cell increases 20-fold. So the cell loses its polarity and its whole surface gets covered up with Mach 1. Now these are very large molecules and they are glycoproteins. They are more gly there's more sugar to it than amino acids. That's why glycoprotein. Now what happens is that transformed cell with its overload of Mach 1 elicits a, an immune reaction. Right? It elicits an immune reaction by T cells or cytotoxic T lymphocytes which attack the cancer cell. Now when people realized this, they were thrilled because they said perhaps we could take the Mach 1 and make a vaccine against breast cancer out of it. 
It's called active specific immunotherapy. That means you've already got the breast cancer, but why not develop a vaccine which you can give to the patients, which might then in turn help attack the breast cancer or the tumor, right? So it makes sense. It makes sense. Now, the thing about this, that what they didn't know, is that this can these cancer cells are extremely devious. What they do is they overproduce MAC1 and they shed it. So the immune surveillance is redirected to the shed mucins while the cancer cell travels through your connective tissue and metastasizes to your lymph nodes and every other part of your body. That's what we didn't expect. And that's what really set this vaccine development back. But it's carrying on. People don't give up, which is good. OK, and this new role for mucins. Now, our HIV studies. Now, I want to tell you something. I gave you, I showed you a gel which separates proteins, a population of proteins from a particular sample by size. Here's another way of separating proteins by size. It's a huge glass tube packed with little beads, right? And the beads have holes in it. When I teach this to students, I say, imagine my glass tube filled with marbles with holes in it. And you take a sample of saliva and you put it on the top, what will happen? The big, large proteins will travel in between the marbles and come out first. The smaller ones will go into the holes in the marbles and their passage would be retarded and slower, and so they'll come back later. Isn't that a brilliant idea? That's fabulous. So my students, right, my students use, it's called cephalosphobia gel filtration, use this method, put saliva onto this column, right, and allow, and then wash the column through so the sample goes through. The big mucin, MUC5B, comes out first. The smaller mucin in saliva, MUC7, comes out second. You can separate the two. So what we did is we took crude saliva, we tested it against the virus. It inhibited the virus. Then we said, but what in the saliva is inhibiting the virus? We took MUC5B, MUC7 and compared their potency against HIV-1. And what happened? We found that MUC5B was far more potent than MUC7. We don't know what salivary agglutin is going to do. We're still waiting for the results. So we found that crude normal saliva inhibits HIV-1. Salivary MUC5B and MUC7 inhibits HIV-1. MUC5B is more potent than MUC7, and this was published. And it's, 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 it's elicited a huge reaction in the international mucus community. I've, I've delivered these papers at Cambridge and other centers in the world, and my students have traveled to huge conferences, and this work is very well received. And, and, and just to tell you, uh, while I'm rounding up, that if mucins in normal saliva inhibit HIV-1, then do the mucins in saliva from HIV-positive individuals do the same? So Hapton Hapte did the experiment, and he found that in, in saliva, salivary mucin proteins in HIV has a different profile to those from normal and that their potency against HIV-1 is not as good as those obtained from normal saliva. So that was an interesting find. So the other big question Hapton asked, and this is just I'm telling you for your interest, if salivary mucins inhibit HIV-1, then other mucins too. We do know that the route of transmission of HIV is through breastfeeding and through sexual intercourse. So what, why? Are salivary mucins so potent against a virus? Why is it safe to kiss and exchange hundreds of mils of saliva with somebody and not get transmission? And yet, with breastfeeding and with sexual intercourse, where there's mucus present, you still get transmission. So, Hapton went on and rounded off his PhD trying to answer this question. And he found that if he took the mucins out of breast milk, 
So he took the crude breast milk, he tested it against the virus, it didn't inhibit the virus. He took the mucins out and tested the mucins individually, they inhibited the virus. So is it a concentration effect? Is it because the breast milk doesn't have enough mucus in it? We don't know. The same